You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode number 18 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all, welcome to the podcast. In 1858, while battling for a U.S. Senate seat, the Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln and the incumbent Democratic Senator Stephen Douglas squared off in a series of seven debates that were staged across the length and breadth of Illinois. The two antagonists met first on August 21st in Ottawa, in the north-central part of the state. By the time the last debate was concluded in the Mississippi River town of Alton on October 15th, the dramatic chain of encounters had drawn national attention. Everyone observed the obvious physical difference between the two candidates. Douglas was known as the Little Giant, but at 5'4", barely came up to Lincoln's shoulder, He was a ruddy, thick-set man, while Lincoln was extremely tall and painfully thin. Douglas had a booming, authoritative voice, while Lincoln spoke in a piercing tenor, which at times became shrill and sharp. But the differences between the two candidates went far beyond the contrast in their appearance. In that epic 1858 political campaign between Lincoln and Douglas, the two men offered Illinois voters and a wider national audience a choice between two starkly contrasting views of the American experience. The debates are deservedly the most famous in American history because the stakes were much higher than a mere senatorial election. The theme of the severant confrontations was nothing less than the future of slavery and the integrity of the Union. Tariffs, banks, corruption, internal improvements, none of those issues received any attention from Douglas or Lincoln during the debates. The sole topic was slavery. Important matters were at stake. Would the Western territories be open to slavery? Would slavery insinuate itself into the states where it was now illegal? Had the Founding Fathers really intended the nation to remain half-slave and half-free? Did one group of states possess the right to dictate to another what was right and wrong? The dramatic historic series of encounters between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas captured the country's attention in 1858 because the debates bore down on the most troublesome, divisive issue facing the nation. Because of that unflinching focus on slavery, a local contest was turned into a major event and provided America with a sensational preview of the pivotal 1860 presidential election. As we mentioned in the last show, after Abraham Lincoln's single term in Washington, D.C., as a Whig congressman, he returned to Illinois and devoted himself to building up his law practice. He thought his days serving in public office were over. But then in 1854, the passage and implementation of Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act reignited the national debate over slavery, and Lincoln, his anti-slavery sentiments aroused, was drawn back into the political arena. Abraham Lincoln had long harbored anti-slavery instincts. Years later, he said, I have always hated slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Lincoln's dislike of slavery back then stemmed less from concern over racial injustice and more from the arbitrary and unnatural restraint that slavery imposed on blacks so that they couldn't embrace their natural rights, that is, those inalienable rights which in America, Lincoln believed, 
were clearly spelled out in the Declaration of Independence as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By the mid-1850s, the Whig Party was disintegrating, so in 1856, Lincoln's anti-slavery sentiments led him to join the new Republican Party. The new party was a seemingly fragile patchwork of assorted political groups, but there was actually a strong tie that bound together the different elements of the new party. They all came together on a platform that called for no further spread of slavery. In May 1856, in Illinois, Lincoln was instrumental in leading a coalition of anti-slavery Whigs and Free Soil Democrats into the Republican camp. With his political ambitions fully rekindled and now coupled to a fight that he could fully devote himself to, Abraham Lincoln threw himself into his new party's battle against the further spread of slavery. Eventually, his standing among the Illinois Republicans was so high that in 1858, Abraham Lincoln won his party's nomination for the U.S. Senate. Lincoln's Democratic opponent would be none other than the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Stephen Douglas, who was running for re-election. Lincoln, in his speech accepting the Republican nomination, set the tone for the campaign. In that speech, given on June 16, 1858, in Springfield, Lincoln focused in on the folly of expecting that Douglas' policy of popular sovereignty could resolve the most divisive issue facing the nation. In his famous House Divided speech, Lincoln said, quote, We are now into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but is constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. End quote. Lincoln's reference to a biblical passage found in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew chapter 12 would have been instantly recognized by his listeners in 1858 and would have resonated powerfully with them. Lincoln went on to say, quote, I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the House to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward, till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. End quote. Now, in stating that slavery might be pushed forward so that it was lawful in all the states, north as well as south, Lincoln was simply following pro-slavery Chief Justice Roger Taney's momentous Dred Scott decision to its far-reaching, logical conclusion. While Taney's ruling in Dred Scott was meant to establish once and for all the legality of slavery in the territories, it really struck down as unconstitutional all restrictions on slavery. And so, with that precedent in mind, Lincoln believed it likely that one day, perhaps in the not-too-distant future, another Supreme Court ruling would allow slavery to be lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. While Abraham Lincoln was busy in Illinois establishing himself as one of the state's leading Republicans, Stephen Douglas had been performing a risky political high-wire act on the national stage. First coming to prominence in connection with the Compromise of 1850, Four years later, Douglas had rammed the Kansas-Nebraska Act through Congress, even though he predicted it would create a political storm in the North. To line up the Southern votes he needed in order to get his bill through Congress, Douglas had included language that repealed the Missouri Compromise and opened new territories to slavery under popular sovereignty. According to the doctrine of popular sovereignty, the status of slavery in a territory was to be determined by the territory's voters rather than by Congress. Right. And previously on the podcast, we've already talked about how this led to so much violence in Kansas as pro-slavery hooligans and anti-slavery settlers waged a miniature civil war in the embattled territory. Despite the bloody violence in Kansas, Douglas continued to support popular sovereignty, 
asserting that only if each state and territory were left to settle the slavery question for itself would there then be continued peace between the North and South. Really, it mattered nothing to Douglas whether slavery itself were morally right or wrong. Politically, he simply didn't think it was an issue that should cause the Union to break apart. Also, since he harbored presidential ambitions, Douglas calculated that with popular sovereignty, by keeping the matter out of Congress's hands, he could continue to talk out of both sides of his mouth, appearing to side with both the northern and southern factions of the Democratic Party, and thereby maintain the support of both those groups for his presidential aspirations. But the Dred Scott decision threatened to topple Douglas from his perch on that risky political fence. On the face of it, the Dred Scott ruling appeared to strike a death blow to popular sovereignty, since it forbade the people of a territory to ban slavery. But while Dred Scott was a shock to Douglas, he quickly regained his balance, cleverly adopting and espousing the idea that, despite what the Supreme Court might say, the people of a territory could still decide for themselves whether to include or exclude slavery. They could do this simply by refusing to enact local slave codes, since, Douglas said, quote, slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations, end quote. Well, however clever Douglas's new argument was, he couldn't make it fit around the Kansas Territory's blatantly fraudulent Lecompton Constitution. Even though that pro-slavery document was supported by the sitting Democratic president, James Buchanan, Douglas still denounced it as a travesty on popular sovereignty and majority rule. Not surprisingly, this caused a bitter division to spring up within the Democratic Party between Douglas and Buchanan. And it was in the midst of this conflict with President Buchanan that Stephen Douglas, in 1858, was running for re-election back home in Illinois. It's important to remember that the Lincoln-Douglas debates were just seven events during political campaigns that stretched over four months. Over those four months, Lincoln and Douglas spoke hundreds of times across the state, and so many more people heard the two candidates speak on courthouse steps, from railroad platforms, at county fairs, and from the beds of wagons than heard them debate face-to-face at those seven events. But because rival Chicago papers hired stenographers to take down every word Lincoln and Douglas uttered at the debates, the news coverage of those seven events completely eclipsed the rest of the candidates' campaigns. And since the two Chicago newspapers' copy was available to the National Wire Service, it could be reported on the East Coast in 48 hours. So for a national audience, while the debates define the campaign, for Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas... They were seven moments out of a grueling four-month-long race. It's also important to remember that neither Douglas nor Lincoln was operating in a political vacuum. Both candidates worked within the framework of their respective party systems, which in Illinois were run by the Democratic and Republican state party committees. For Lincoln, this was complicated by the fact that the Republican Party was a relatively new entity, a fragile patchwork of different political groups. He realized that his speech-making during the campaign and his performance at the seven debates would be scrutinized and analyzed by the different elements of his party, each of which wanted reassurance that he was their man. This was especially critical in the central Illinois counties, which were former Whig strongholds. Lincoln knew that to claim victory over Stephen Douglas, he would need to win over those old-time Whigs. And as we've already mentioned, Douglas's campaign was complicated by the fact that he was in the midst of a bitter feud with the leader of the National Democratic Party, President Buchanan. But while Buchanan leveraged all the influence he could to undermine Stephen Douglas's campaign, Douglas, on the local level, could still rely on the Democratic state political machine he had built up over the years in Illinois. And with regard to the race itself, at this point we should probably mention that back in those days, U.S. Senators were elected by state legislatures rather than by direct vote of the people. And this wouldn't change until 1913 and the 17th Amendment to the Constitution. So in 1858, as odd as it sounds to us today, 
Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas weren't actually on any ballot. What the people of Illinois would do was vote Democratic or Republican in the regular state legislative elections, knowing that the composition of the state legislature would determine which Senate candidate would be sent to Washington, D.C. Does that make sense? Well, basically, if a voter wanted Lincoln to be Illinois' next senator, he'd vote for a Republican candidate for the state legislature, thereby hoping there would be a Republican majority in Springfield. On the other hand, if a voter wanted Senator Douglas to be sent back to Washington, he'd vote for a Democratic candidate for the state legislature, thereby hoping there would be a Democratic majority in Springfield. Okay, so with all of that as background, let's get to the debates. Well, actually, first, we should probably point out that the debates almost didn't happen. When the candidates began their campaigns, Lincoln's strategy was to follow Douglas from place to place, and wherever Douglas spoke, Lincoln would give a follow-up speech. Now, this saved Lincoln's campaign money, since Douglas had already paid to advertise his own appearance, and so Lincoln could count on a ready-made crowd that had already gathered to hear Douglas. But after just a couple of weeks, it became apparent that Lincoln's strategy of following Douglas from place to place was making it seem as if he was content playing second fiddle to the senator. Really, it made Lincoln seem as if he were afraid he couldn't draw crowds on his own. And so, concerned that Lincoln would spend the entire campaign in Douglas's shadow, the Republican State Committee quickly came up with an idea that would change the whole shape and tenor of the contest. At the prodding of his advisors and the State Committee, on July 24th, Lincoln wrote to Douglas, asking him, Will it be agreeable to you to make an arrangement for you and myself to divide time and address the same audiences during the present canvas? Well, other than the fact that this was a formal challenge from Lincoln, and he would lose face if he refused, it seems as if Douglas, as the incumbent and as a national political figure, had little to gain from accepting his opponent's offer. But Stephen Douglas, the little giant, was never one to back down from a fight, and so he agreed to debate Lincoln. Douglas proposed limiting the number of events, though, to seven, and he named the place and dates that would fit his own schedule. Well, after a week of negotiations and one face-to-face -face meeting to hammer out the details, Lincoln wrote from Springfield saying, I accede, and thus closed the arrangement. Each debate was to be three hours long. The first speaker would deliver an hour-long opening statement. The second man would then have the floor for an hour and a half. The first speaker would then return to the podium for a half-hour rebuttal. Douglas would have the advantage of beginning and concluding four of the seven debates. There were no restrictions on the issues that might be addressed, or on what they could say. Okay, so with all of that as background, let's get to the debates. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? 
Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were eagerly anticipated in the places where they were held. As Ronald C. White Jr. explains in his biography of Lincoln, quote, In the 1850s, in rural and small towns across Illinois, politics and religion were often the main shows in town. With frequent elections, politics provided year-round drama, entertainment, and sources for gossip. The seven Lincoln-Douglas debates became the Fourth of July picnic, summer revival meeting, county fair, visiting circus, and visiting lecture all rolled into one grand pageant. People came from miles around, arriving early and staying late. Hotels overflowed with guests, with visitors sleeping on cots and halls and parlors, or in pews and churches, or on the streets on warm summer evenings. The debates became dramatic theater, featuring two actors on stage who could not have been more different in height, look, and political philosophies. The enthusiastic audiences were often larger than the towns where the debates were held. End quote. A reporter from the New York Post captured America's passionate fascination with politics, which was reflected in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. He wrote, quote, It is astonishing how deep an interest in politics the people take. Over long, weary miles of hot and dusty prairie, the processions of eager partisans come. On foot, on horseback, in wagons drawn by horses or mules, men, women, and children, old and young. End quote. And on August 21st, the people poured into Ottawa in north central Illinois for the first debate. Ottawa, population 7,000, was located at the confluence of the Fox and Illinois rivers and was the seat of LaSalle County. LaSalle County had gone for Fremont and for Republican state candidates in 1856, but it was only just above the boundary of the vital Whig belt, and so both Lincoln and Douglas would work hard in Ottawa to win over swing voters. By the day of the debate, a Saturday, between 10 and 12,000 people had converged on the square at the center of town. Special trains brought spectators from Chicago. The debate was scheduled to begin at 2 o'clock, but the crush of people in the streets around the square delayed the two candidates' arrival at the speaker's platform, and so the contest began half an hour late. Stephen Douglas led off this first debate, spending the majority of his first hour on a slashing attack of Lincoln's speeches and actions since 1854. In going on the offensive in Ottawa, Douglas wanted to sidestep having to defend his own record and instead forced Lincoln to defend his. Douglas accused Lincoln and the black Republicans of supporting a despicable and divisive abolitionist conspiracy, and he read from a list of resolutions that he said the Republicans had adopted in Illinois in 1854, which he said proved his claim. Douglas also reminded the people of Lincoln's opposition to the Mexican War, and of his revolutionary and destructive house-divided speech. And then, for good measure, Douglas warned the crowd that Lincoln wanted free blacks to move to Illinois and live in equality with whites. As Alan C. Gelzo explains in his book on the debates, quote, There it was, within the limits of one hour. Lincoln was an abolitionist conspirator, out to seduce the old Whigs into an abolition spider's nest. Lincoln was an unreliable politician who had voted against his country's interests in time of war. Lincoln wanted black equality, and Douglas had not said one word about the failure of popular sovereignty in Kansas, not one word about the Lecompton Constitution, not one word about how popular sovereignty was supposed to work in the territories in the face of the Dred Scott decision, or how it would work in Illinois if a companion case to Dred Scott on slavery in the Free States ever came within the grasp of Roger Taney. End quote. 
When Lincoln rose to offer his response, the crowd cheered so loudly and so long that it was several minutes before he could begin his rebuttal of Douglas's accusations. One of the reporters at the debate described the scene in this way, quote, He had a lean, lank, indescribably gawky figure, an odd-featured, wrinkled, inexpressive, and altogether uncomely face. He used singularly awkward, almost absurd, up-and-down and sidewise movements of his body to give emphasis to his arguments, end quote. As Douglas hoped he would, Lincoln spent his hour and a half refuting the accusations that had been leveled against him, rather than taking the discussion off into a different direction. Spending his precious time on a string of denials, Lincoln rebutted each of Douglas's charges and appeared as if he had not thought out anything of his own to say and had no plan but that of reacting to whatever Douglas said. Nevertheless, the larger Republican crowd was naturally sympathetic to Lincoln, and when Stephen Douglas rose to make his final half-hour appeal, he was greeted with so much catcalling and heckling from the crowd that the mayor of Ottawa had to step forward and demand quiet. Douglas then said that his opponent could deny as many things as he liked, but he couldn't deny the unashamedly abolitionist resolutions the Illinois Republicans had adopted, and Douglas continued to hammer on his assertion that Lincoln and the black Republicans were divisive abolitionists. In a letter written the day after the, after the debate in Ottawa, Lincoln said, Douglas and I, for the first time this canvas, crossed swords here yesterday. The fire flew some, and I am glad to know I am yet alive. But in truth, neither Lincoln nor his friends were happy at how quickly and how effectively Douglas had put him on the defensive. And so, determined to go on the offensive, Lincoln and his advisors worked on a list of questions he could put to Douglas at the second debate. Before the next debate, it was also discovered that what Douglas had claimed were abolitionist resolutions passed by Illinois Republicans were in fact resolutions from some obscure county meeting of an abolition group that had no association at all with the Republicans. It appears that Douglas had received some bad information from a political associate and had run with it in the debate without first checking to see if it was true. Well, needless to say, Lincoln planned to make the most of this revelation. The second debate took place six days later, on August 27th, in Freeport, just south of the Wisconsin line. Freeport, population 7,000, was the county seat of Stevenson County, and being so far north in the state, was as safely Republican as any place in Illinois could be, so Lincoln could expect another sympathetic crowd there. In spite of overcast skies and the threat of rain, upward of 15,000 people converged on Freeport for the debate. Lincoln, this time speaking for the first hour, immediately struck a more confident tone in the second meeting. Besides making the most of Douglas's mistake concerning the abolitionist resolutions, Lincoln also set a trap for Douglas. As White explains, quote, At Freeport, Lincoln became the hunter and Douglas the hunted. Lincoln took the offensive by asking Douglas four questions, the second being the most critical. Question two, can the people of a United States territory, in any lawful way, exclude slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution? Lincoln's advisors had encouraged him to ask this question. It was meant to push Douglas to speak about the meaning of popular sovereignty within the new legal landscape of the Dred Scott decision. End quote. As White goes on to explain, Lincoln and his advisors knew that Douglas came into the Senate campaign trying to sit on the fence between his cherished popular sovereignty and the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision. And with this question in Freeport, Lincoln was hoping to force Douglas off the fence. If Douglas answered no, that settlers had no right to decide about slavery, then it would be obvious to everyone that popular sovereignty was powerless to stop the expansion of slavery. But if Douglas answered yes, that popular sovereignty still allowed settlers to exclude slavery from a territory, then he would further alienate Southern Democrats who had already been put off by Douglas's previous waffling on the issue. Well, Lincoln, of course, knew how Douglas would answer the question, 
since Douglas had already clearly shown his desire to circumvent the Dred Scott decision. But still, Lincoln wanted to force the issue out into the open. Douglas rose to the bait. He started off his hour-and-a-half reply by responding to Lincoln's four questions. He answered question two directly. Quote, It matters not what way the Supreme Court may hereafter decide as to the abstract question whether slavery may or may not go into a territory under the Constitution. The people have the lawful means to introduce it or exclude it as they please. End quote. As he had many times before, Douglas then offered his rationale for this answer. Quote, Slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations. End quote. By allowing that popular sovereignty would still allow settlers to ban slavery from a territory, Douglas's answer to what became known as the Freeport Question would come back to haunt him two years later, when Southern Democrats flatly refused to support his nomination for the presidency. As we'll see in a future episode, most of the Southern Democrats walked out of their 1860 convention, leaving Douglas's presidential ambitions to be propped up by only the northern half of the Democratic Party. Well, anyway, after answering Lincoln's four questions, Douglas, as he had at the first debate, hammered on the race issue. Douglas used the term black Republicans 18 times at Freeport. Again and again, he referred to Lincoln's ideas by using the terms abolition and abolitionizing. Douglas's plan for the debates was obviously to paint himself as the champion of white man's democracy and Lincoln as an abolitionist fanatic who would let free blacks flood into Illinois. At Ottawa and Freeport in the northern part of the state, Douglas was obviously trying out his race baiting of Lincoln, which he knew would play especially well later on in the debates still to be held in the central and southern parts of Illinois. All in all, most of Lincoln's supporters believed he had done a much better job at Freeport. He had seized the initiative with his four questions. Most impressively, Lincoln, with a lawyer's precision and logic, had proven that Douglas's scheme of popular sovereignty had no meaning after Dred Scott. Pinned down by Lincoln's second question at Freeport, Stephen Douglas's answer would win him votes in Illinois in 1858, but not across the nation in 1860. Well, all right, that's where we're going to start to wrap up this episode. Obviously, our coverage of the debates is going to be a two-parter. So with the next show, we'll start up again with the third debate at Jonesboro. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation for this episode is Alan C. Gelso's book, Lincoln and Douglas, the debates that defined America. The Atlantic Monthly described Gelzo's book on the debates as the deepest, most instructive study yet of how on-the-ground politics actually worked just before the Civil War and how ordinary people involved themselves with the nation's most faithful political question, the future of slavery. And really, if you want to dive into the details, not only of the debates, but also of the campaigns, that both men uh, ran there in Illinois in 1858, you need to read Gelzo's book. All right, so there. Okay, as always, you can find all of our book recommendations on the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. And as you are rushing to check out the website, we'll sign off. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Civil War. 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us again next time for part two of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.